Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about um, some of the uh, immigration consequences that are associated with uh, juvenile court proceedings and juvenile adjudications. Um, I'm just going off an outline, which should be in everybody's materials. There's not going to be anything relevant up on the screen. Um, obviously, there's a lot of nuance and complexity to, to these issues that we just don't have time to cover today, but I think this is a decent overview um, that hopefully at least lets people kind of issue spot a little bit um, with, with this type of situation. Um, so in general, what you hear a lot about in terms of immigration consequences of, of you know, criminal cases is um, the, the consequences of a conviction. Um, there are obviously, you know, there are conviction-based grounds of uh, removability, um, inadmissibility, and bars to certain types of immigration relief. Um, the important thing about that for, for these purposes is that juvenile court adjudications are not convictions for immigration purposes. Um, also, obviously, that makes it uh, particularly important for non-citizen children to stay in juvenile court when that's a possibility, um, even if, you know, adult court is otherwise appropriate or preferable some, for some reason. That's kind of the baseline um, assumption that I think everyone, everyone makes with, with non-citizen kids. Um, most immigration penalties for crimes do require convictions. Um, not all of them do, and that's kind of where I'm going to spend the most time today. There are a few grounds um, in, this, in the INA, the Immigration Nationality Act, that are called conduct-based grounds, where criminal conduct, regardless of the age of the person, regardless of the outcome, is sufficient to trigger an immigration consequence. Um, juvenile court, you know, filings and dispositions and stuff like that can give the federal government enough evidence um, to uh, proceed with the immigration consequence associated with, with that ground, um, you know, regardless of what the, the disposition is um, and regardless of whether there's a conviction. So I, I put in a chart in there um, just about common conduct-based grounds and consequences. Um, these are just kind of what you see most often. It's it, These are like the vast majority of, of these grounds. There, there are some additional weird ones, but they would be really uncommon. Um, so one of them is prostitution. That's being the prostitute, um, not vice versa. Um, inadmissibility is the consequence there. Um, waivers are often available for that, meaning that if you hit this type of situation, it's not... Um, it's not something that's inescapable, but there is that additional complexity of whether the person is going to be eligible for a waiver. Um, drug trafficking is the most dangerous number one problem. Um, that's called the reason to believe ground um, of inadmissibility. Uh, and the reason it's particularly dangerous is because the standard is really low. You know, it really is just this reason to believe language, um, and there are no waivers except for very, very limited circumstances. Um, similarly, um, you know, these kind of next ones are centered around the idea of whether this person is going to be a, a danger to themselves or others. Um, so drug abuse, drug addiction, multiple offense, multiple drug offenses. Um, similarly, like a mental disorder, um, posing a threat uh, to, to either the person or others. Um, both of those grounds are potentially waivable. Um, use of false documents and fraud offenses, um, particularly relating to false claims of U.S. citizenship um, that results in inadmissibility. Um, false claims to U.S. citizenship are really serious um, and can result in removability and ineligibility for relief. Um, there are some defenses to that when the person is a minor, whether they knew they were making the false claim. Um, but that's just something to keep a close eye on because it can have consequences that are very, very disproportionate to what the action actually is. That one is, is waivable under certain circumstances. Um, 
And then violations of no contact orders is another important one because that can really sneak up on you. Um, that's a, a removable offense. Um, anytime a state court finds that there's been a violation of the no contact order. So that doesn't require a conviction. It just requires a finding that this occurred. Um, and again, there, there are some waivers available for that. They're a little more limited. So those six things are really like the fact patterns that you want to be looking out for if you've got, um, you know, if, if you're looking at any kind of admission, if you're looking at any kind of adjudication, if you're looking at any kind of filing um, that, that has a factual basis in it. Um, the, like I said, the, the absolute most dangerous ground in there is the reason to believe drug trafficking ground. Um, that basically burns everything down um, in immigration. Um, and, you know, that's regardless of how many years later the person is seeking status. Yeah. How do they define drug trafficking? Is there a certain quantity of drug trafficking <clears throat> Yeah, so there's not a, a quantity um, like threshold. The way it's defined in the statute is pretty broad. It's sale, distribution, possession with intent, manufacture, delivery, anything to that effect. Um, I don't want to give you the statutory site off the top of my head because I'm not, it's, it'll be INA 212A something. Um, it, it, it'll be in there and they, they do give a definition. Um, the, so really, I mean, the most common situation to be concerned is like a possession with intent situation. Um, it's not quantity so much. Um, but again, the issue there is like, if by the time you see that charged, you really have to be very, very, very proactive in dealing with the underlying facts because the disposition is not going to be enough to, to clear that ground. Um, it's also important to note that the existence of a waiver is not a guarantee. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is reason to believe to find it all or is it self-explanatory? Yeah, <laughs> um, there's case law on it. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory um, and it is very, very broad. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't know that there's really clear case law that gives a better definition than just that, that general thing. There, there's really unfavorable case law about like, you know, is, is the person in possession of, um, like are they charged with possession with intent? Do they give any admissions to um, like intending to give it to anyone else? Anything like that, um, reason to believe is very broad and it's really, really tough to litigate whether there is, yeah. What, and I guess what are some examples of what might be grounds for waivers? And I'm thinking about these kids that come in you know, if we're talking conduct-based grounds and not even the co conviction, like drug abuse, suicide attempts, right. like what, I mean, that information is then out there whether it is the conviction or not. So right. what are potential waivers so we can start helping and gathering that information for whoever might be able to help them if that somehow gets to ICE? Sure. So this is, I feel like what we, I'd love to have time to go in detail today. Um, basically, the, the, overview is that what waivers are available are going to depend on what type of relief the person is eligible for. Rachel's going to talk about this thing, special immigrant juvenile status, which is going to be by far what most people are going to be eligible for. Almost all grounds of inadmissibility are waivable under special immigrant juvenile status. Um, Possession is, um, but it gets really complicated. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Isn't there still an exception um, as far as what de deportable offenses are? I'm sorry. Um, I forget what term they use, deportable. Jessica, what do they call them, that category? Felonies? Aggravated felonies? Aggravated felonies. Isn't there still, and that's that's immigration's definition, um, but isn't there an exception for 20, 
grams or less of marijuana for personal use still? So that's a ground of, this is, it's a mess. Um, there's, there's an exception to removability for 30 grams or less for personal use. Um, so again, this gets really, really into case specific stuff that it's very hard to give a general overview for. Um, if you've got someone who's undocumented, that doesn't help because they need to be admissible and any controlled substances offense makes them inadmissible. Waivers, generally speaking, there's a couple different categories. Um, one, one thing that makes children particularly vulnerable where waivers are concerned is um, that a lot of the big categories of waivers require what's called a qualifying relative, um, which generally means a spouse or a child. So most children are not married and do not have their own children. Um, and so that cuts out a lot of options for waivers. Special immigrant juvenile status includes certain waivers of admissibility. Um, and other major categories, well, the other really big category to keep an eye out for is U visas, which is where the person is a victim of a crime. You can get pretty much anything waived with a U visa. Um, so that's a really important one to keep an eye on. Um, does that kind of answer your question about waivers? It's, it's, it's a little hard to say based on, basically the way, the way to assess the case is if you know you've got a problematic charge or, or you know, allegation, you just have to do an assessment of the person's immigration status, figure out what forms of relief they might be eligible for, figure out if those forms of relief include waivers, figure out if your person qualifies for a waiver, and then figure out how to make the charge as safe as possible. Um, so it's hard to, it's hard to get more specific than that. Um, the other thing to just be aware of is that relief from, from removal and other immigration benefits almost always includes an element of discretion. Um, you see this throughout the statute where it's, you know, the attorney general may in his discretion. Um, so it's, it's just useful to know when you're going forward with stuff like this, that immigration applications are always gonna require a full disclosure of criminal activity. Um, anybody can always look at juvenile adjudications and the underlying facts as negative discretionary factors. Um, so as far as that ground goes, sealing and expunging can be useful. Also, while you're kind of dealing with whatever's going on in juvenile court, um, you can kind of be thinking proactively about building evidence of rehabilitation um, and kind of building it. If you know, if you know you're going to have something unfavorable in the record, you can always see if you can put something favorable into the record to kind of balance it out if it's being looked at later on. I should probably turn it over to you. Thanks, everyone. I'm Rachel Antonuccio, and I'm going to talk specifically about special immigrant juvenile status. And these materials should be um, in your packet as well. Let's see if I'm getting this right. Yes, do, do I need to do something? How do I move forward? You can just send it down. Okay, I heard this. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so first of all, talking about who's eligible for this form of relief, this is a form of immigration relief for children specifically. And in immigration land, a child is defined as a person younger than 21 years old. The child seeking relief cannot be married. And a state court must make certain findings in order for this kid to apply for this form of relief. So the court must find that the child is dependent on the court that the child has been neglected, abused, or abandoned by one or both parents, not necessarily both. You could have one parent who's doing well and another parent who uh, has victimized the child. The child is unable to reunify with one or both parents, and it's not in the child's best interest to return to his or her home country. Um, so there are many venues through which you can seek orders that would allow you to pursue this form of relief. A China case is the easiest, in my opinion, venue to get a state court to make these necessary findings because in order to be adjudicated, the child very likely meets some definition already of neglect or abuse or abandonment. 
Um, obviously, in this instance, we don't, we're only de dealing with children who are under 18 years of age. And so um, really any party can petition the court to make these findings. The non-abusive parent, if you represent the non-abusive parent, frankly, I guess even the abusive parent could request this order, um, a guardian ad litem or a county attorney. And the court can place the child with a non-abusive parent. The child doesn't necessarily need to be in a foster care scenario or residential treatment. The court can still keep a kid with their parent and you can still be eligible for this relief. Um, you can also pursue this form of relief through a delinquency proceeding. Julia and I are working on a case like that right now with Emily Voss in the back. Um, has worked on this with us too. This is trickier, and if I were to do this again, and I'm sure I will at some point, I would maybe request that a China be pursued separately, um, just because with the delinquency, some of the factors that are coming to light are those that Julia discussed. Um, it's part of your, your package, you're already dealing with the fact that this kid was engaging in delinquent behavior and was either adjudicated or received a consent decree for that. Um, and again, the child doesn't necessarily need to be placed in residential treatment um, or in foster care in order to qualify. You can also pursue this through a custody or divorce proceeding. So a non-abusive parent or family member could petition for custody and family court as part of a divorce or custody case and allege abuse or neglect or abandonment by the other parent. It would be wise to get the court to appoint an independent guardian ad litem to assist in kind of looking into this. And the same deal with the district court guardianship. So a family member or friend could petition the court to be the legal guardian of a child. Um, perhaps the parents are undocumented, have been deported, or left the child with a friend. Um, the friend who petitions does not necessarily need to be a United States citizen. So that's just something to be aware of. And again, it's wise to make a request for a guardian ad litem. Um, when requesting these orders, oh, I'm sorry, someone have a question? I was just going to say, um, speaking for Polk County, it's not that easy to get a China opened. You can call the child abuse hotline, the one 800 362-2178 and request a China assessment. But it can be hard, especially if the kid has kicked around for years with some problems, but no one's deemed it worthy of opening the case. Um, but I was gonna say in Polk County, you know, we have one judge assigned to probate and he has been amenable, Judge Block, to including the necessary findings. The ones I've worked on, an immigration attorney has sent a client to me um, to get the guardianship opened. And then I confer with that attorney to put in the findings, like the same findings that you say need to be included. And generally, it, it hasn't been difficult at all. And that's, that's a really good point. If you can't get a China open or if the kid is not eligible for a China, then a guardianship is a good way to kind of get around that specific issue. Yes. I think you need to get, I think they have to hand you the microphone. I'm sorry, because I think we're on a, the webinar. I was just going to say that not everybody is aware of this, but anybody can file a China. All you need is permission of the court. So anybody can approach the court, a juvenile court judge, and ask for permission to file a China. So. Um, so one of the things that's important for a court to understand when they're making these findings is that they're not actually granting legal immigration status. I think because immigration is so amorphous and scary, I don't think state court judges always understand exactly what you're asking for. So you're just asking the court to make findings that will then later be reviewed by USCIS. Um, so just make sure the court's aware of that so they're maybe not as trepidatious about making these findings. So in your motion, you're outlining why the child meets the definition of someone eligible for special immigrant juvenile status. Again, younger than 21, not married, dependent on the court, even if dependent on the court means that the court has placed the child with the non-abusive parent. Child been neglected, abused, or abandoned. Child is unable to reunify with one or both parents and not in the child's best interest to return to his or her home country. Um, that may be a difficult call for some judges to make, so it might make sense to include an attachment with the home country conditions, um, you know, a citizen, uh, a human rights report um, that kind of explains the, the conditions back home if this kid were to return. 
Um, so again, just to kind of give you more specific detail and to add the portions of the INA and the CFR that are relevant, I just go through this bit by bit. And so this is the order that you would present to the judge with the specific findings. Obviously, the first very um, vague findings that you need to do and then move on to the fact that the court has placed the child, is eligible to place the child in the care of someone, um, and even if that person is the non-abusive parent, um, especially if the child is a child in need of assistance, indicating that they're still under the court's jurisdiction is important. Um, again, that they're legally committed to or in the custody of an individual or entity appointed by a state or juvenile court, the relevant INA and uh, USC code sections are there. We've been having some of these come back with RFEs or requests for further evidence um, because the state court sections have not been included in the orders. So just make sure any broad findings that you're asking the court to make also include the state court sections that sort of line up with whatever you're asking the court to find. Um, reunification not viable with one or both parents for any of the many grounds that reunification may not be viable. And then uh, ask the court to make specific findings about why that reunification is not viable. So this is just sort of an example of, of one that we drafted recently. The dad is believed to be a resident of Mexico, but his specific whereabouts are unknown. The child's mother left the dad when the child was an infant because he was abusing illegal substances. The dad has not seen or communicated with the child since she was very young, and he's not provided any financial or emotional support for the child. Um, so really detailing why that reunification is not viable is important. Um, again, detailing the reasons why the court believes it's not in the child's best interest to return to her, his home country. So again, this is just a template. The child's not resided in Mexico since she was two. Um, some children may not speak the language of the country in which they'd be returning. Um, outlining the dangerous conditions in whatever country they are, would potentially be returning to. And also outlining the services that are available to them in the United States juvenile court or state court that they would maybe not have access to otherwise. Um, so this order is only the beginning. Um, the child has to submit their application to USCIS. So you're really just getting the first pieces of this done. You're going to need to be connected to an immigration attorney or willing to do that work on your own um, to pursue that application. And the state public defender's office, if you're court appointed, is not going to pursue is not going to pay you to pursue the actual immigration relief um, once you get that initial order. So that's just something to be conscious of. The wait's also extremely long. I mean, we've had applications we filed in 2016 that still have not been approved. So it's important for folks to be cognizant of that when they're applying. This is not going to be quick relief. It's also important for the non-abusive parent to understand that this um, pursuing this status does nothing to protect them directly. It does not grant them status. And if a child is granted this form of relief and able to adjust status, she cannot later petition for relief for her parents, even the non-abusive parents. So just something for folks to be cognizant of and understand from the outset. Um, I know we didn't have a lot of time to go into detail, which Julie and I were lamenting, but this, if you're interested in learning quite a bit about special immigrant juvenile status, the law school um, has uh, put forth this resource, which you can just access through this link. It is extremely detailed. It takes you through a lot of potential case scenarios. Um, it's a really excellent resource if you want to understand more about this form of relief. And I think certainly Julia and I would welcome folks reaching out to us if that's something that came up down the line. Any questions? I know everyone's eager to get to lunch. Okay, thank you.